for a little less time, that's fine. But we mustn't speak for any more because um, I would like to put a limit on of an hour and a half of um, talks. Um, as with the previous talks, these are going to be recorded. I will check actually, yes, it's been recorded in the cloud right now. And as with the previous talks, these will go up onto the website as well. What I won't do is cut them up into individual talks. It'll be one single file that goes up onto YouTube. So before we start, I'm quickly going to say a couple of things. I've posted the address of the um, web page for this um, event into the chat area. I'm just trying to get it back. There it is, chat. And then you'll, so you'll see the information I have about the order in which people are speaking. We'll run with that order. Um, and if the attendees haven't given me, some haven't given me um, a web address or whatever, give me your web address after your talk and I'll make sure this page gets updated. So if you're interested in knowing some more about the people speaking, I'm sure everyone has their um, email address on their website. So we'll make sure that goes in. Um, and then one other thing that I will come back to at the end is that for the next season. So what I've decided to do is break this up into seasons. So we have four talks and then a group chat like this. Um, and I was going to have some a couple of weeks off in between the seasons, but I, I sort of forgot that when I invited the first speaker. So we go straight into season two next week. And I've actually booked the whole season. So we have four speakers. And then throughout the um, those four sessions, I'll be asking for people who want to volunteer to give um, a short talk like this. Um, I'll talk a bit more about who the speakers are and why they've been selected, why we've um, selected those at the end. Um, but I think you'll find it a, another really interesting season. So I think what we'll do now is I'm pretty sure we've got our 46. So that was, that was how many people registered. So um, it's probably a good time to start. So as I mentioned, 10 minutes maximum per speaker. The speakers do have slides. Um, the first is Nancy Jo Ward. And if you want to, I'll actually have to ask people to give themselves a little introduction because there are people here I don't know. So if you can give a very brief introduction and then um, you have your 10 minutes. So good morning. Actually, it's afternoon here. I'm in California. A lot of you are in uh, London, so it's nighttime there, but it's bright and sunny here today. Um, I am a media artist and a professor of art and design at Hancock College in Santa Maria, California. Um, I obtained a BFA from the School of Visual Arts in New York City many years ago and headed to the West Coast for the summer and never returned. Uh, so I've made a, a life out here uh, creating fine art, teaching, and uh, working as a professional designer. Um, what I'd like to do, if you don't mind, can I share my screen so that I can show some work? And how is that possible, Sean? I see, so I see. Use the share screen button and hopefully your, uh, your screen or slides, whatever you've got, will appear up. All right. And so um, I'm going to run these slides and talk over them. Um, so uh, and then at the end, I'm open for questions. All right. In the mid 80s, I began to embrace digital tools in my design business. Several years later, it seemed like a natural progression to develop a hybrid approach to working with digital tools and traditional media and the available print technology at the time. Projects were either started on paper and digitized or developed directly on the screen. Techniques were further developed as software advanced, including new mark making tools and digital algorithms. Eventually, my process settled into compositing layers of images and drawing or painting directly on the screen. These files are output to large format printers using archival links on archival substrates and then worked back into with traditional art media like acrylics, oils, or chalk pastels and eventually with applying, uh, applying metal foils. In 2018, I earned an MA with distinction from the University of Arts London, Camberwell College in Fine Art Digital, led by Professor Jonathan Kearney. My research at Camberwell expanded this investigation of hybrid art processes. 
Ultimately, I began experimenting with outputting these files to different substrates, such as Hannah Mula William Turner, a mold made rag paper, Pictorico, a crystalline coated polymer film, Allure, a primed aluminum panel, and Silk to see how they reacted with traditional art media and light. Through innovation, experimentation, and techniques that mixed past and present, I'm interested in contaminating the contemporary with tradition. My subjects are explored through the recontextualization of photographic images and the art of remix. The photographs are sourced from my personal pictures and screen grabs from the internet and social media of people, places, and things. They're combined through algorithms and marks made by hand and enhanced through into artificial intelligence. Just as the camera changed not only what we see, but how we see it, I believe the internet has changed what we see and as artists, how we respond to it. My interest is in pushing digital projects into physical spaces through an exploration of the aesthetics of post-internet culture in the pursuit of an engagement with what I call relevant fiction. These portraits are of women who do not exist as you see them presented. They're made up of many images, often unrelated, but curated toward a goal of experiencing human emotion through light, color, and texture. Recently, I found a way to work using my iPhone. After a flood in my studio, everything had to be dismantled and packed into a storage container for five months while it was being repaired. I found an app that I could use to create the base art and then using markup tools from my camera app, I could draw with my finger. These files are airdropped to my desktop and the resolution enhanced with AI software. My work is based on a personal narrative influenced by the experience of being in this place at this time. And my art practice involves finding the beauty of something that is in between what was and what can be. This process is full of discovery as I search for something to emerge from this interstitial space of interacting layers and marks made by hand, hopefully in a way that creates an emotional connection. So I've um, also started working with uh, experimenting with augmented reality and experimental video. And I uh, opened up one of my experimental videos and uh, shortened it. So if you don't mind, I'll try to run it now. Trying to find a way to work in a time-based um, experience.
and that is me. Mm. Um, wow, well, thank you very much. That's um, fascinating. Yes, it's a, you say. Um, we have time. Unless, um, I've got a couple of questions, but I'll hold those unless somebody else wants to ask um, some questions. So um, I do have Anton T here with his hand up. So or, um, did you have a question? or um, Anton, no, maybe not. Okay, anybody else? Okay, I'll be let's, let's be quite quick. What I'd be interested in is um, the experience of using foil um, on the prints. Um, how did you approach that? Was that done using a special printer that had a foil? Um, uh, no, that's that's all done by hand. Yeah. Uh, by hand using traditional gold leafing methods. Ah, nice. Yeah, and it's something I've been interested in doing, but I've been looking to see if I can find someone with a printer to do it. But you were doing it by hand. Okay, that's good. I'm doing it by hand because um, the work I do, I don't print mass quantity. Of, mm. there, it's not like I have um, you know runs of twenty or fifty. I just do one ofs, mm. and then they're hand um, finished. So it's more like I do versions. So I have a version on the archival paper or a version on the um, the film or a version on the fabric. But I'm not interested in, um, maybe I should be more, I'm really not interested in selling massive prints of the same image. Oh, I, I get bored. Yeah. Mm, great. And um, also, there, I know there are a few people here, including myself, who went to Camberwell. I did my master's at Camberwell as well. We have Jonathan Kernley, so uh, that's interesting. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, brilliant. That, that was a really interesting talk. I, I think we'll keep a, on a pace, as it were. And um, there might be a bit of time at the end for some other um, talks. I've got your web address, um, which I've put onto that page. But if you wanted to send me anything else just to go on that page, that's fine. Um, OK, so let's hand over to um, Alandino now. Um, who actually is somebody I know from Leicester. He's at the uh, Leicester University. There are two universities in Leicester, De Montford and Leicester. I'm associated with De Montford, but we're not rivals. <laughs> <laughs> they work together very nicely. So again, if you'd want to do a, a very short intro to yourself and then give your presentation in less than 10 minutes. So over to you. Yeah, thank you, Sean. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm based in the University of Leicester, uh, where I am um, a young digital artist and lecturer, researcher. I just started my career. And um, so today I will just wanted to talk about um, some of the work uh, I do. Uh, so I just share my screen. Uh, yeah, can you all see? Yeah. Okay, so I don't know why it jumped. So yeah, basically I started my um, studies in composition and performance of contemporary music and I started merging the use of computers with composition and I don't know why it's jumping. Um, and uh, so I started using computers to make music. And uh, one of the things it did struggle me at the very beginning was that uh, when performing contemporary music and uh, using computers, it was the interaction with computers, how difficult it was sometimes to perform a musical instrument and at the same time um, controlling uh, uh, audio processes, uh, lighting effects and visual effects and so on. So as I'm working on uh, the development of several interfaces and modes of interactions, uh, one of which, um, this is one of my first works, it was the um, METIS, uh, it's a tangible user interface where uh, you can use uh, digital, um, several disks and uh, touch uh, on this interface to control different uh, audio visual processing parameters. And I then composed a piece called Il Sogno nel Sogno, uh, performed in uh, L'Aquila in Italy. Uh, and this was part of my major project during my undergraduate studies. And basically here the um, orientation, the speeds, uh, the direction and uh, several touch gestures on the interface will control um, audiovisual elaborations and lighting effects. Uh, the direction and uh, several oh, touch gestures. I don't, on the I don't know what, what just happened. Apologies, uh, my PowerPoint presenters are going crazy. 
Um, after that, I started more looking um, at the control of um, at the interaction with sound using a more embodied uh, interaction, and I start using um, IMU devices and um, electromyography sensors uh, to track the uh, muscles activity of a performer and then uh, to map these uh, parameters uh, into audiovisuals, uh, controls and lighting effects. Um, so, and the first performance uh, was um, realized in collaboration with uh, Vittoriana D'Amici's and uh, here um, she was performing um, Katie Berberian uh, Stripsody and um, and basically, uh, the, my aim was to use the already learned gestures by the performer. Uh, so the system um, was designed in a way that um, the interaction wouldn't disrupt the performance. And so the choreography, uh, the choreography uh, indications left by the composer. And um, another... Uh, Example is uh, another example is the wooden devoter. Uh, this was a performance realized in collaboration with Eleanor Turner. Um, here uh, with Eleanor, we designed. Uh, she composed a performance, uh, and I designed a system that uh, would track all already learned gestures uh, by the artist. So. I will take advantage of all uh, the um, already um, already learned gestures, the gestures that was already that were already part of the instrumental technique of the performer, to then control lighting effects and uh, visual elaborations. Um, I also uh, realized several um, several installations. Uh, one of which is um, Equinod. Uh, this installation instead um, uses um, the invites the audience um, to play with their own equilibrium and so to explore their own body uh, in a in multi-sensory environment uh, where there are different sound sources coming from different uh, directions um, and uh, so there were different lighting effects uh, in this immersive environment and so the audience will step on this platform and use uh, their own equilibrium to uh, interact with uh, the music and uh, the lighting. Um, another uh, installation is uh, Inner. Uh, this is more a recent work, uh, which is a work realized in collaboration with um, the sculptor uh, Cartin, uh, Victoria Cartin Rivera. This was premiered in Salerno uh, the first time and now and uh, recently um, exhibited in Rome at the, the Arte Scienza uh, Festival, uh, realized by the Centro Ricerca Musicale in Rome. And uh, this uh, work instead invites the um, audience uh, to reflect on their own inner state and on the, this abstracted wooden art. Uh, there are placed five uh, heart rate sensors sensors and so the um, audience could interact with the uh, musical work and the lighting through uh, their own uh, state by controlling their own um, health, um, health, health rate. Uh, currently I'm working on uh, exploring different ways of um, interacting with sounds, uh, so developing new uh, interaction paradigms, um, which here I start calling human sound interaction, which uh, uh, I might a more uh, uh, tangible interaction with sound using uh, midday raptive feedback and sound and uh, holographic projection. This is a prototype of a first work, which uh, was realized just a few months ago. And uh, so yeah, this uh, was me uh, and my work. And uh, yeah.
Great. Well, thank you very much. That was very interesting. Um, any questions? Uh, again, clap. Yeah. Apologies for all the mess with the <laughs> with the with the presentation. Uh, uh, feel free to pop your hand up, virtual hand up, on the um, uh, a participant list if you want to ask a question. Um, if not, I'm never short of questions. I I, I think maybe. Uh, one might be, what was the technology we were using at the end? It did look like a projected hologram of some sort. Yeah, well, uh, this is a kind of, is a very early <coughs> prototype. Uh, mm -hmm. Here I use the, the paper ghost illusion. Yeah. Uh, so you cannot really see the effect there. So basically you have this paper ghost illusion, um, which, uh, and then there is the that plate, that black uh, plate at the, on the desk is an array of ultrasound speakers, which basically pushes air, uh, it uses ultrasound to push air against the, the hand, and so generates haptic feedback. Oh, haptic feedback, okay. Um, and so I, I'm, I started trying modeling uh, an abstracted representation of the sound uh, through haptic feedback. Mm. And uh, so I'm trying to combine um, haptic visuals and sound at the same time to explore different ways of manipulating the sound. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Oh, I do have a question here from uh, Dave. What do I have to do to work? Right, um, Dave, you should just be able to talk, actually, I think. <laughs> yeah, I can talk. It's all right. Um, yeah, I'm interested in the sensors that you're using. Um, especially the heartbeat one. Is that an infrared sensor or does it follow the blood flow density? Yes, it is a very uh, cheap and basic earth rate sensors that you can buy off the internet for like 50p. <laughs> and basically it's, um, it's then hooked up um, to a Bella board uh, which I use for the um, audio elaborations and then with uh, with uh, Raspberry Pi I do all the rest like uh, machine learning for the composition and um, the lighting uh, and so on. I was also thinking about um, in an exhibition setting um, making that safe. I'm not talking about COVID-19 or anything but um, <laughs> you know th there are implications for that because I have a heartbeat driven work as well and it's always been an issue that you get lots of people coming in and touching it and you think, how yeah. do I make this safe, you know? Uh, yeah, actually I started reflecting on this and then started to, to reflect with the COVID-19 on the, the use of the, the importance of touchless interaction yeah. and so using cameras and uh, about heart rate, one, I don't know if there could be or, or not a solution, but maybe the use of, um, directional uh, microphones to maybe relate the, the, the breathing through the air pressure from far away. Um, so like, um, do you know the shotgun uh, cinematographic microphones, the very directional ones so yeah. that you can point uh, very carefully to people and maybe that could be a form of uh, touchless interaction, let's say to track breathing, I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. No, thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you very much for that. So let's move on to our next speaker, who is um, Benjamin Baxter. Okay, let's try sharing the screen. I, I should also add that I, I got the um, YouTube streaming working, so we're on YouTube as well at the moment. Okay. I'll just put it up on Facebook for everybody as well. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Can you hear me okay, Sean? That's fine, yeah. All right, great. So. I'm here representing a group of uh, artists from Alborg University, and we're making something, we're making a prototype at the moment called the VR Archive, which is an open world platform for VR artwork. And we come from, uh, our study is in Denmark, but we have uh, group members from the UK, United States, Faroe Islands, and Serbia. Um, to give a little bit, a bit of background to why we're doing this, we're studying art and technology at Alborg University, which is a great course. Um, and our fourth semester theme was looking at uh, sustainable places and interactive spaces. And we had to look at the United Nations development goals as a sort of overall broad theme. When looking at the goals, there was a demonstrable lack of um, 
any relation towards artistic or the sustainability of artistic culture or culture in general. So we thought, you know, that's quite disturbing. So we decided to try and make a project which might actually uh, help in that respect. So that's why, why we started the archive. Um, and what we're doing is building a VR world. At the moment, we're here in the prototype world, mountain world. And we're building a prototype for an exhibition coming up. Um, and then if there's interest in the project or VR artists wants to get involved, then we will build future worlds and uh, eventually a large archive. Um, so Mountain World is our prototype and any VR works that are going to be included are made by the founders of our VR archive or any close friends or associates who want to get involved at the beginning of our project. Um, what we're building is a very basic uh, sort of mountain landscape <coughs> where you get spawned into the middle and then you can go around the world and go and visit different markers, each of which contain uh, a different VR artwork. Um, so the markers will be uh, in different places. We will be um, giving each piece of artwork a unique coordinate number which we will use as uh, part of our cataloging system. I've been pleased to talk to both Sean and Alex May so far about the problems with respect to archiving digital work and how it has to be uh, potentially done in other ways because the technology might not last for, for very long but right now we are, we are, we are trying to build this, this basic archive. Um, we get into if, if we have enough interest and enough people want to exhibit their work we will make another world maybe for the first 50 members um, you can visit our website download the application and start actually viewing different works obviously you're going to need a VR headset which uh, not many people have at this moment we're lucky enough to have one with, uh, with amongst our group um, as the worlds grow we will um, be able to take in more pieces of artwork um, and eventually hopefully we would end up with an unlimited space so that anyone that could put forward their artwork could have it included in our archive but exhibitions that we put on may still well be uh, curated by us or by guest create curators so that we can sort of keep the work a little bit under control but the idea is that, that there should be acceptance of all VR artworks in amongst our library in an attempt to preserve it because the United Nations essentially in their goals aren't doing much towards preservation of artistic culture. Um, so we've got an exhibition coming up on the 15th of May uh, which uh, you can view online unfortunately at the moment because of this lockdown it's not going to be a, a physical exhibition and some of our prototype artworks uh, uh, this piece by myself, Green Flace Black Shadow, um, which is uh, discussing the relationship between funding of the United Nations and its history of uh, who, who put it together. And then to Everspace by uh, Bojana Kusic, which is kind of more of a game environment. So each of the artists in our group are, are putting together one piece to put into our library. And this is Leap of Faith by Anton Thorbell, um, a Danish artist. So there's going to be open platform for all sorts of different VR artwork that can be included um, and we hope that people might potentially want to join in. So this is a, a call to artists in a way um, if anyone out there is interested um, we would love to include your artwork in our prototype library and if the library takes off and there's enough interest we will build it uh, for, uh, uh, as a proper project for the future but at the moment it is a prototype um, and that's what we are doing at the moment. So please take down the, the email address if you want to contact us and we can tell you how, how we need the files and in what format we can use and this kind of stuff. But that essentially is uh, our project. Um, any questions? Great. Yeah, um, well, uh, what I wondered is that if your exhibition opening is on the 15th, I was looking at our calendar and um, we haven't got an event on that night. Would you fancy doing a little exhibition walkthrough for people? We could, we could certainly send a video uh, of the exhibition um, because at the moment during the lockdown not many people can actually put the headsets on and view it. Yeah. So we, for the exhibition we're going to have to present to our university a video version. Mm, okay. Um, 
that's where we're at at the moment, unfortunately. When the university opens up again, then we can get in and maybe develop the project. Mm. But um, we could certainly put a video together of, of what it looks like in a, in a few weeks' time and uh, get back in contact or give you guys a link. Yeah, well, give us the video and possibly do a, do a little talk over and take a few questions or something. It might be a good way of um, generating some more interest in the project, which looks very good. That would be great. And thanks for your time again. Um, yeah. any, question, any other questions at all? Okay. okay. Well, the, um, oh, well, was there a question there? Oh, no. Um, what, I, what I say is, um, let's, you know, if there are some questions at the end, we can make a bit of time then, but we're nicely on schedule at the moment. So I think what I might do is launch straight in and ask Afra um, if she would like to do her presentation. So if you could maybe, um, Ben, if you could close down your screen sharing. No and problem. Afra, yeah. Let's zoom. Stop share. There you go. Okay, so uh, over to you, Afra. Well, Afra has disappeared. Oh no, that's good. <laughs> and I'm going to unmute you. Oh yes, brilliant. Hi everyone. Um, very nice to be here. Thank you, Sean, for hosting us. These talks have been really brilliant. Um, so my name's Afra Shemza. I am a um, multimedia artist and I'm going to be talking to you about Art in Flux, um, which is an organisation that I co-founded in 2016. So some of you may know us and for some of you it might be new. Um, I'm going to absolutely whiz through these slides because I could probably talk for a whole hour about what we've been doing. Um, so I'm gonna, it's going to be a rather a whirlwind. Oh, hello. Doesn't seem, oh yeah, okay, perfect. So um, I'm Afra Shemza. I'm one of the three co-founders of Art in Flux. I'm a multimedia artist and I make art using um, abstraction, interactivity and light. And so here you can see some of my pieces. I combine traditional sculpting techniques with technology to create my practice. Um, Art in Flux London was founded in 2016 um, by Oliver Gingrich, Maria Almina and myself. And we are all artists working with art and technology and new media work. Um, Flux is a not-for-profit charitable organisation that's committed to furthering the development of the media arts community in the UK. Um, we started in 2016, we founded in 2016 at Lights of Soho Gallery. Um, which was a lovely members club. And here you can see our very, very first um, meeting there with our 30 artist friends, basically, that we invited down to come and have a, um, a chat with us and to ask them what they would um, benefit from, from a group and what we could provide for people. And the, the idea then was that we would create a peer network for artists working with technology who could come together and discuss their work, exchange, network and collaborate. So that's how we began. Um, so I just want to touch on the two co-founders. So Oliver Gingrich is an amazing artist um, and the creative director of um, MDH Hologram and a producer of, of the collective and Lima group. Um, he works a lot with holographic technology, so it may be interesting for you, Balladino, to talk to him about what he's been doing, um, and also with brainwave technologies as well. Um, Maria Almina, the other co-founder, is um, the co-founder of Kimatica Studio, um, which is a, um, they produce performance and they work a lot with um, live body mapping technologies and wearable tech, so it's a lot about transformative technologies, um, and the three of us really cover these kind of quite broad themes within the media arts, um, allowing us to really kind of cross over lots of different genres and um, skills and knowledge. So in, I'm just look, glancing down at my stopwatch there to see how, where I'm at, because I'm talking very, very quickly. Um, so Flux produce um, many different types of events. One of the events that we hold is the Flux Socials and they really come from our beginnings as an organization. So the Flux Socials are monthly meetups for artists to come together and to profile their work to each other. Our artists are, it's an open call each month so anyone can come along and present their work and it's a kind of space for networking and, and peer exchange and support within the community. Um, here's some images from some of our events there. 
Um, we've worked with an uh, absolutely enormous uh, array of artists over the last kind of four years. And um, we were so pleased to see so many artists at our social, our virtual social offering last week. It was really amazing to have all these great minds in one place. Um, so you can, you can go on our website and have a look at the different artists that we've worked with. Here are a few. There's Sean there down at the bottom. Um, and then we've also, one of the things with Flux is that we didn't just want to stay as a peer network. Um, we wanted to open up and provide a platform for these artists to the wider public. And um, so we do that through collaborating with institutions and organisations like CAS, um, like the VNA, like the National Gallery, like EVA London, and provide a platform for these artists to exhibit their work and to the wider public. So as part of our offering of providing new media events to the wider public, we orchestrate and curate talks um, focusing on relevant topics in the media arts. Um, so last year, the three of us curated a talk around a theme that is, is our interest. And then we invited artists to come and speak about those topics. So we had um, levitations about transformative technologies, which was a collaboration with Central St. Martin's Art and Science MA. Um, that was curated by Maria. We had Invasive Media, which was all about kind of big data and media, and that was curated by Oliver at the Royal College of Art as part of Event 2, um, which I'll just touch on in a, in a moment. I'm glancing back down at my stopwatch again. Uh, Radical Ecology, uh, which was my event, which is about um, sustainable media art and how we can consider the conservation and legacy of our artworks as artists working with technology, and that's something that I'm really passionate about. Um, these are a couple of images from, from that Flux, from our Flux Talks program. And uh, we also, of course, being visual artists, we also produce exhibitions. So in 2018, we held our first um, exhibition called Art in Flux at Ugly Duck. We exhibited about um, 20 artists, I think. Um, we held a program of talks. Um, we had a workshop and um, that went down really really well it's kind of like a mini festival we had these amazing performance evenings as well that maria curated um that um event so we we took our art in flux um name and we've now named ourselves art in flux we began as flux events and we collaborated with the computer arts society probably many of you know about this event that happened last year called event two um, event two was a collaboration with the Computer Arts Society, which was held at the Royal College of Art last year. And the Computer Arts Society exhibited um, the CAS 50 collection of historical and contemporary computer art. And Art in Flux were asked to exhibit our contemporary artists working with new media alongside their collection. And that gave us a really amazing historical um, context for the type of work that we as contemporary artists are creating now, which was fantastic for um, many of our artists have that public platform. The event went so well that we were invited to the VNA um, and we produced a small part of our exhibition alongside CAS at the event too at the Digital Design Weekend. And we also took there um, one of the workshops that we ran at event two, which was by one of our artists called Stuart Batchelor, and it was his painting with code workshop. And that went really well. I think the youngest participant of that workshop was about three years old, which is kind of amazing, really. Um, so very intuitive youngster working with computer art. Um, the workshop kind of leads me into a project that we did. I'm just going to play this, but I'm not sure if video really comes out very well here. So we'll see. Um, Workshops is one of the things that Flux really want to um, continue working with and we really feel like art and technology is quite a, um, a difficult thing to bridge to the general public and local communities and so um, we started with a project called AYA um, which was a collaboration with Sara Chowdhury and the Grenfell Tower community. Um, so this project was actually nominated for a pre Ars Electronica which is fantastic. And um, this year, it was a um, community project where we looked at Islamic digital art and um, local families and the community were able to come to a space and to draw um, Islamic digital patterns. And then these artworks were then um, 
these parts of a whole, these geometric patterns were then turned into an animation that was projected back into the community and also shown um, at an exhibition alongside um, very established artists like Zara Chowdhury, um, Zara Hussein, you may know, and Ben Johnson. Um, I am, I'm gonna, I can probably share a link to this YouTube video so that you can see a bit more of it because I know that we're wary for time. Um, I'd say maybe pop it in the, um, the chat to one side and people can look at it. I'll pop it in the chat. Yeah, that's a great idea. So um, we have obviously now we're in this sort of COVID crisis. So we've sort of changed our program being completely events based and face to face um, to being a virtual offering. So we're now running um, Flux Socials online um, and they're running every month. And we've got our next one on the 28th of May. Um, and if you're an artist working with art and tech, we'd love to have you come and get involved and have a kind of conversation and peer networking about what we can do um, in this new digital age. Um, so I'll drop another link to that in the in the um, in the chat. And um, we've uh, have this amazing residency now with the National Gallery X, which is a new space for um, artists working with technology. And we are going to be hosting three events with them. Um, around gender, migration and well-being. And our um, next event, which will be purely an online offering, will be um, called Gender Tuck, curated by Oliver Gingrich on the 16th of June. So we would love to have you um, join us for that event as well. Um, and these are our website and social media handles. If you want to get involved, please do. Great, oh, that's perfect timing. And um, what I'm thinking is that maybe you could let me have um, the details and dates of those events and I'll put them into the CAS calendar uh, and publicize them so um, people can see what else is going on and maybe the um, people who are here can attend your meetings as well, so. That would be brilliant, yeah, I would love, I will share all those details with you um, just now, yeah, that would be great. Great, oh, uh, okay, Terry has a question, um, very quick one. So, Terry, do you want to say something? Yeah. Um, no, I just wanted to mention that I've been to quite a few of these uh, Flux socials, and they're great events. Um, I think um, Flux, Art in Flux, is doing a great job, and it's becoming more and more important as we emerge from this COVID-19 situation that everything that we do will suddenly assume a new meaning and a much greater validity than it ever has done before. And of course, uh, Flux is uh, in the front of this particular uh, motivation. That's all I want to say, Joe. Great, thank you very much. Um, okay, I think we'll, let's move on to the next speaker. Thank you very much for that, Ephra, and that virtual round of applause. <laughs> thank you. Um, and next speaker is Daniela. So a little introduction and maximum of 10 minutes, please. Yes, hi Sean, hi everyone and thanks for having me. I will uh, talk about a project that I already presented at uh, EVA last uh, August, no, July, end of July. So here I'm sharing the screen, I hope it works. Um, right, okay, so I will try and be quite uh, quick on the project that I already presented because I also would like to talk about an experiment that I conducted during this uh, time of isolation where I started looking at some of the ideas I had at the back of my uh, mind for uh, years even. Um, so for some of you uh, who have already uh, so my talk at the EVA, um, I work at uh, the intersection between neuroscience, radio astronomy, and virtual reality. I've been uh, conducting this kind of work for the past uh, 10 years. And I will briefly talk about my project Cogito in Space, um, which I developed uh, at the Dwingelo Radio Telescope in the Netherlands between 2013 and 2018. Besides being um, a media artist, I'm also a radio operator and a radio telescope operator. And uh, this project consists in uh, sending brainwaves into space while the participant watches a film in virtual reality of the Earth seen from space. And uh, because the project requires quite a different kind, a different um, 
kinds of expertise. Uh, it has become an international collaboration, including neuroscientists, uh, a radio operator, and a filmmaker. The idea of um, sending brain activity into space has already been explored in uh, 1977 by a uh, renowned uh, American astronomer Carl Sagan, who encrypted a one minute recording of uh, brain activity in the Golden Record, which is now traveling in uh, interstellar space. And also um, has been explored by Stanislav Lem in the science fiction novel Solaris where the um, transmission of brain activity into space is aimed at a possible communication with an extraterrestrial intelligence. And of course, also the follow-up film by Andrei Tarkovsky, also called uh, Solaris. Um, one of the main fields of research in uh, this work was the overview effect by Frank White. Frank White has been uh, interviewing astronauts since the late 1980s and he has been um, um, researching the effect that uh, seeing the Earth from space has had uh, on their uh, cognitive, um, um, on their awareness, on, uh, on their uh, cognitive shift, so to speak. Uh, he reported that all, um, almost all astronauts actually had this cognitive shift for which they um, gain a greater awareness of the Earth as a, a, a united environment, as, as a global interconnected um, uh, spaceship. So the, <clears throat> sorry, the project exists in uh, two forms. We have a mobile installation that travels all around the world to festivals and uh, art galleries and where the participants can uh, have their brain activity recorded while they watch the film in the virtual reality and we transmit their brain waves into space in real time uh, through a remote connection with uh, a, a radio antenna. And uh, another version is a site-specific installation hosted at the Dwingelo Radio Telescope. And uh, this is uh, an event that we hosted in uh, late 2018 a group of people traveled to the radio telescope and they were first conducted into a walk around the national park surrounding the scientific facilities and then they were um, they entered the cabin of the radio telescope to uh, per, to uh, assist uh, to this performance where several participants send their brain activity into space also, uh, the event was uh, introduced by a series of talks, including a talk by Frank White uh, on the overview effect. The work in progress was very interesting. Uh, it lasted about two years and the main challenge was for the neuroscientists uh, to create a code that would allow them to um, um, transform in real time the electrical signals recorded by the 32 electrodes spread across the entire skull into a mono sound that we could send into space in real time. And also this combined with virtual reality. So it was quite challenging. These are some of the images from the virtual reality film. And uh, I created this work together with the filmmaker Sandro Bocci. And uh, we had in mind um, uh, the idea of an abstract narration of the evolution of the cosmos and uh, also uh, the formation of, of life in the cosmos leading to uh, a few uh, more uh, realistic, so to speak, images such as the curvature of the earth seen from space and also the blue marble image uh, symbolic, symbolically uh, disappearing at the back of the retina and uh, to settle in the individual memory of uh, each viewer. So these are the only two images that are actually evoking uh, something realistic. Um, and it's very interesting because when we interviewed the participants, they all uh, describe how they engaged with these images and uh, the radio operator Michael Sanders took this, uh, uh, realized this uh, spectrogram, essentially he vis visualized the brain activity recording uh, in a line and uh, the changes you see the, in the pattern are uh, the moment when 
certain images trigger the particular reaction in the viewer. And we realized that uh, all viewers had the same reaction, pretty much at the same uh, moment uh, throughout the video. So we are trying to explore this a little bit more scientifically as well. And um, I would like to talk a little bit about the experiment I conduct during this uh, lockdown. Uh, on 15th of April, I finally decided to uh, continue with this project in a, a follow-up stage. Um, I don't have a name for this yet, um, but uh, I, um, I had this recording of uh, the brain activity of a locust that I received from the team of Professor Amira Yali uh, in um, Tel Aviv in 2015. And uh, this lab is specialized in studying the, uh, um, the neuro signals of locusts and they are really at the forefront of this uh, research in the world. And uh, I received the, brain, the, the neuro signals of, uh, of a locust and uh, sent, sent it as a sound uh, uh, using this um, um, omnidirectional antenna, which is based in Italy and uh, operated by Ennio Donofrio, who is my collaborator in this project. And um, so the, the neuro signals were uh, sent in all direction uh, in space. Uh, so this project uh, is, um, of course, going to be developed a bit uh, further. And I wanted to play the sound uh, of the neuro signals of the locust, but I think it won't work with this setup I have here on Zoom. So I'm sorry about that. But um, I can say it's quite uh, interesting, especially uh, having learned how they record these uh, neuro signals. Essentially, it's actually very gruesome. So they cut uh, the body parts of a locust and yes, and uh, uh, the, the locust uh, continues producing these uh, neuro signals uh, for um, sometimes uh, even hours. And um, so, um, okay, so I'm actually, yes. So the, the website of the project is cogitoinspace.org and also my website, danieladepaulis.com, uh, in case you would like to learn more about uh, the background of the work. And that's Great. all. Thanks very much. Could you pop both of those in the chat and then I'll put sure. them on the page for the event as well. That's great. Yes, uh, I'm trying to, okay, stop sharing. I'm back. <laughs> great. Okay. I will uh, put this in the chat. Okay. That's thank brilliant. you. Yeah. I think there are probably lots of people who would like to ask questions, but I think we may have to move on to the, the next talk as we're cutting it a little fine now. Um, oh, saying that, I can't, I don't actually have a list of who the next person is. I've changed web page where I had it all. I'd have to go back to that web page. Um, but yeah, that's very interesting work. Um, that combination of radio and art. Um, I've, I've played a little bit with amateur radio. And one thing I've been doing in my loft here over the last couple of weeks is I've got a, a little software radio that visualizes the spectrum. You know, and I've been like tuning around trying to find interesting signals. And um, I hadn't had anything from space, but I found... Um, pages and things like that so digital data you don't realize is out there it's quite easy to decode i feel there's a project in there somewhere but it's also a bit personal some of the data um right so i'm just going to double check the next speaker there it is it's roger roger okay yeah so um thank you very much um daniela a little virtual round of applause and then um We'll hand over to Roger, um, who just as a, by way of a very quick introduction before he introduces himself, was a very early member of the Computer Arts Society, um, I think from 1970. Um, so very long, maybe even earlier than that. Okay, so 69. So I don't know if you're going to mention that. I'm just going to unmute you. Um, uh, but yeah, so Roger's been associated with the Society for a very long time. And I think you're unmuted now. So over to you, Roger. <coughs> So is that okay? Yeah, yeah good. Okay. Well, good evening, everybody. My name is Roger Saunders, as Sean has said, and I joined the CAS in 1969. Although I was studying computing at Brighton Polytechnic, I was able to assist with the exciting projects that went on. CAS was young, 
and so was I really. But have I moved on? This is my story of digital graphics. I'm sure you want to know what a digit graphic is. Well, here is an example. That is a digit graphic from 1970 and it's produced on a line printer. And that's why it's a small selection of characters available. And it's only 120 wide and 50 deep. Only 600 points that can be uh, presented there. Here's another one. It shows that the algorithm which I was shown in 1969, the end of 69, actually is quite flexible and was producing interesting results. So I don't claim originality for the idea. What I did was to develop it, exhibit some of the results in 71 and 70, and 71 I wrote a paper which was published in the Computing Journal of the BCS I call them character maps because, well, the patterns are made out of characters on a line printer. As I worked with the patterns, I noticed that they could be changed by small adjustments to the parameters. Anyway, more about that one later. Many years later, the paper was discovered by Wolfram Mathematica, and they produced a demonstrator for the idea. They called them digit graphics. In fact, Saunders digit graphics. Having a bit of mathematics in the email to me is really quite an honour. I will show how they are made and why the name is very apt. To produce a digit graphic, first imagine a plane, a field that stretches to infinity in all directions. Got it? Two dimensions is sufficient. Then consider a portion of that which is manageable, perhaps in the middle. So the algorithm is a mathematical term, function of x and y, and the function is x divided by y. A very simplest formula. This is going really back to basics here, but these are interesting results for the 70s, early 70s, and I have examples here, and the CAS collection has got some too. So let's go on to the artistic bit. For each digit, 0 to 9, assign a symbol in the case of a line printer. As I say, 120 wide and 50 characters deep, in a field of about 600. I left plenty of blank space up here so that the um, otherwise the symbols would be just a page of, um, of symbols. Again. The page would be a page of symbols. So, in the case of these days, you can have colour. Because it go down to the pixel level. And of course, 1920 by 1080 is over 2 million pixels. So that's rather good. Get much more detail that way. So, first of all, we number the top of the page, left to right, with a series, an arithmetic series. I would just choose something simple like 1, 2, 3, up to 19, 20 for x axis, and the vertical 1, 2, 3, 10, 18 for the y axis, which of course is 16 by 9. And then another artistic bit you need to decide which decimal digit you want to plot 1 or 2 or 3. Work well, 4 gets rather chaotic, so just using those 1, 2, or 3 works well. So at each intersection with x and y value, extract the decimal digit that you need. Say, for example, x is 23 and y is 42, gives us 0 0.547619. So decimal digit 1 is 5, 2 is 4, 3 is 7. So apply that to the lookup table, which you decided on originally, and print a symbol if it were on a line printer, or a colour. 
Repeat for two million times. Put the image. That takes about five seconds from my machine here. So this is where I was heading. For years, I've been wanting to produce a moving image. That's why it's doing more with digital graphics. The more is a moving image. And now I've retired. I was in computing, uh, business computing for 43 years. And now retired. I'm able to have time to actually concentrate on learning Python, for instance, and making this work. So here is like a uh, world premiere. So I'd like you to watch it and think about it. Tell me what you thought and also what you felt. There is no sound. Any comments, first thoughts, or questions? Very good. Uh, I think again, um, unless there's someone desperate to ask a question, I might just ask a quick couple of questions myself. Yes, sure. Okay, just um, I think well, first of all is a comment, which I think it's, I, I think uh, most of us here hopefully understand that digital arts isn't a new thing and it shouldn't obsess about the latest tech if it's going to be good art. There's nothing wrong. With the latest tech. So true, so true. Yes. But it needs to um, be aware of its history and I think what you're doing here is you're looking at the algorithms that you were working with almost um, 50 years ago and representing them using modern technology right. and um, I think that's a, a very valid and very worthwhile thing to do and um, if you could let me have a copy of that, in fact I have a copy of that video, I'd like to put it up on the CAS site actually Mm -hmm. And I'll link it over to your entry in the Computer Arts um, collection, CAS50 collection, right. because um, Roger's actually given us a number of those early images um, and they form part of our art collection. So it'd be very interesting to connect those almost 50 year old images to the, the contemporary work you're doing now. So thank you very much for that. Great. So a quick round of applause thank for Roger. Thank you. I have to um, put us straight into the next talk, which is um, Dave Everett and uh, Fenya Raksinski. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we need Roger to stop sharing. Oh, Roger, if you could stop no, sharing. No, 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 press stop share. I think he has actually. Um, yeah, yes. Oh, try again. There <laughs> we go, sorry. <laughs> okay, I'm um, okay. Um, so uh, we work together, um, there's a link, uh, these slides are up online, we'll put a link up later. 
Um, and that's a little bit about our history. Um, I come from a fine art background. I went to Loughborough um, under Ernest Edmonds at the time where Sean was in fact a little bit earlier than me. And yeah. then and then I, I have a computer science background um, um, with a PhD with sort of natural language processing and poetry, uh, that sort of angle. And, and we met in, in the IOCT. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a little bit of history. Um, our first collaboration was a paper critiquing um, computational creativity and creative computing. And uh, that's a link to the paper there, if you want to follow that. Um, this is the first artwork that we did together. This is actually leads into what we're going to talk about. Um, this was an artwork that was based on a corpus of hundreds of texts from diary entries, which we processed according to the intensity of the solar weather. So it's live now. Um, the intensity of the solar weather chooses the words according to... Uh, it's, yeah, it's using basic sentiment analysis um, you know, associated with the text. So, yeah. Yeah, so that it picks out phrases from the diary entries that are more or less strongly or weakly worded, as it were. So when there's a high solar activity, you get more intense language coming out, which is interesting. That's been exhibited um, a couple of times now. Um, we're going to move on to, yeah, Magic Squares, which is uh, an abiding interest of, of mine and yours. And uh, that's a simple magic square, just to um, explain what it is. It's a grid of numbers that adds up to the same total in all directions. Now, that looks very plain and simple, but there are some quite interesting things you can do with it. Uh, one of the things you can do is join the numbers in sequence, so you get this magic line. Now, that's what normally people see. If you can see my mouse moving there, that first one. But um, Fanny has been working on different ways of creating um, SVG graphics that connect the lines in different ways and create patterns. And this was our starting point, basically. Um, I started in 1980s. Um, that was the first app I did using Apple's HyperCard. And uh, I've tried to sort of expand on that ever since. So that was the next iteration. That was created at Loughborough University um, with a PhD student. Um, and it's solely driven by heartbeats. That's been exhibited in various places. And it's worth pointing out that this was based on Magic Cubes, which is the yeah. 3D version of Magic Squares. So it has, you know, another dimension to it. Yeah, so the, the, the participants put their finger in to the heartbeat. The heartbeat um, sort of pumped up the Magic Cubes up to order about 12, I think it was. And then the processor couldn't handle it anymore, so they shrunk back down again. But they created different colours according to the heartbeat. And that's a particularly garish example, but it's the only example I've got from that era. Um, this is what we're working on now. We're working on an extension of that uh, Magic Square software. It looks very simple at the moment, um, but we have a series of controls. Yeah, I mean, maybe going back briefly, the, idea, the main idea is that uh, we want to visualise a whole the whole set of Magic Square. So there's there's lots of them. So this is a lot of data that we're looking at for the different orders. For order four, there's a number of depending on how you categorize them between 880 or 7,000 roughly. For order five, that kind of increases exponentially. So we're looking at 86 million and we want to visualize them, you know, on, in, in the web. How many um, have we got so far? Uh, we, yeah, we, we ran our algorithm yesterday and it almost, only generated about 2 million overnight. <laughs> it's a problem, but we'll get there. Um, but yeah, so you can, there's, there's lots of things you can do, you can adjust colours, you can adjust sort of the, the spacing between the, the individual squares, um, you can, and, and more importantly, you can animate them, um, so that the, the lawn sort of draw, draws itself, and we have an example in a minute. Yeah, um, I mean, this is our tool, basically, we created our own tool for, for manipulating these. Um, so what we're trying to do is, I'm not going to read all these things out um, tediously. Um, but basically, we're trying to create an overall tool which not only um, creates visual images, but also helps us with our research into the background of it. And we're looking at some um, contributions from the Magic Square community. Um, by the way, it's nothing to do with magic. <laughs> it's just mathematics. Um, but it's unfortunately called Magic Square for historical reasons, which we won't go into now. A lot of this is taken from the, our forthcoming um, EVA talk, which we're going to expand on. So. 
I won't expand on that now. But one of the main things we're trying to do is eliminate duplicate patterns, which I don't think has been done before. So that's our original contribution, or, or it has been done, but it's not been done in the way that we're doing it. That was the first output that was um, uh, exhibited at um, Sean's Interact um, exhibition in Leicester in 2019. Um, I won't explain it, but um, the print, it was the first thing we'd had printed ever. <laughs> We've always worked digitally, so um, that, was a, that was a kind of breakthrough. This is the first hard copy of something. Um, the interesting thing about magic squares is that if you plot that line in different ways, um, there's so much variety from one simple set of rules that there's completely asymmetrical squares and there are totally symmetrical squares. And that balance between symmetry and asymmetry is absolutely fascinating. Um, we've overlaid um, things that's still from an animation. These are some of the images that we're creating at the moment. Um, this is an animation of the magic line, very simple one. And that's a very small extract. If you imagine 880 doing that, pushed together, uh, we didn't want to, you know, show something more complicated, but that's the kind of thing that we started with. And then that partial animation can be frozen and we're creating works like this, that are like a spidery sort of sketch. There are echoes of this kind of work in, in other artists as well. And we're trying to move away from that into something more original, but um, there you go, there's another animation. So we'll leave you with that animation and any questions that you want to ask. Okay, I reckon we can get a question in if somebody has a particular one they want to ask. Um, otherwise, you mentioned these slides are available online. If you pop that in the chat, I'll link yep. it on the web page into the slide so people can have a closer look. Yeah, no problem. I mean, the only thing I would add is that this is a little bit like Steve Reich's music in, in the phasing, <laughs> in that um, these phase in and out because they have different line lengths. So that creates an almost infinite set of permutations. And we're only looking at a set of 880 here. When we start on a larger set, we're going to have a lot more possibilities. Mm, very interesting. Yeah, yeah, okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you for that. Just pointing out that these are all unique. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, and then we'll move on to our next speaker, which is um, who is Brian Reffin Smith. Hopefully, um, you're okay there, Brian. Yep, you are uh, unmuted. Great. Yeah. Okay, um, I'm going to. Uh, try to share one of the two screens. You'll either get the real keynote screen with everything on it, or you'll get my screen, which has got my notes and the next slice and stuff, which doesn't matter at all, but I'm interested to see which one you'll see. Share. <laughs> oh, you got the full screen. Have you? Yes. You, you can't see a thing that says double tap to edit. Okay, so Brian Reffin Smith and I've been working with computers in art in a mostly kind of conceptual way for, um, I was just calculating this and it's terrible, we're about 52 years now. Um, so there's people been doing it a lot longer, I know, and not all of them are dead, um, fortunately. Okay, um, when you start keynote it proposes things like this so i thought well i'll turn that that stupid double tap to edit thing inside out what i'm going to do is to start with the idea of inside out in a visual way then go on to show that you can do it with things that aren't visual and then try to generalize from that going towards making the periphery more important than the central idea in art. So this is taking an idea and generalizing it. It's not by any means a survey of what I do, but it's a slice through some of it. This is Nicole Kidman turned inside out. Um, you can imagine how this is done. Yeah, you take the edges of an image and map it to the center. You take the center and map it to the edges and the middle stays just about where it might be and so on. Here's Boris Johnson also turned inside out. Um, which was a pleasure in a way. Then I, what I thought was, how about making these little sliding puzzles? And the image that you see there is um, a painting by numbers picture. I'll come on to painting by numbers later, but I, I use that quite a lot. Um, one, two, and three at the bottom there um, are the colors that you can use to fill in this picture. They're all black. 
um, the picture is of a gallery assistant dressed in black observing the Malevich's black square. So it would be all black anyway. So for the mathematicians, I wonder if you can imagine a way to use these sliding things such that the outside gets mapped to the inside and vice versa. Now clearly you can't do it totally efficiently, but um, I don't know if it's possible. I, I don't want to try. Um, of course, it doesn't have to be visual. You can do the same sort of thing with music or with a book. Now with a novel, for example, you can rip all the pages out and take the first and last pages, put them in the middle. You can take the middle pages, put them at the beginning, at the end, um, and so on systematically. You can also do it with film. Um, and I've done this with Casablanca. Um, you can actually put the first scene and the last scene in the middle and also put the, the uh, middle part back into the, um, uh, uh, into the beginning and, and the end. And you can do it with music. You can do it with sound as well as, mu I mean, audio and music. Here's an example of Frère Jacques, you know Frère Jacques, yeah? Frère Jacques, Frère Jacques, bum, 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 blah, bum, blah, blah, bum, blah, 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 blah. And um, what happens is I'll play a bit of it. Can you hear that? This is not a canon. This is inside outs on the level of bars and notes coming into it as well. Okay, um, that was really quick. I doubled the speeds because I know that we don't have too much time. Um, I was at a conference in, in uh, Lisbon and they gave us these cakes and these wonderful wrappers and I, it's a perfect example of inside out in a way um, because that's the paper that was wrapped around the cake. Um, so the peripheral became more interesting even than the cake itself. Boris Johnson painting by numbers. There are 12 different colours in this picture and they're all black. Um, I tried to sort of get conceptual or political or funny stuff coming and I, I don't just like, it's difficult. Um, I've got slightly more time than I thought because I've knocked a few slides out and I'd just like to say that um, of course painting by numbers, making your own pa painting by numbers things can be interesting. Most of these things I'm showing you, uh, you need a computer for but some of them not necessarily so, but I would say that none of them would have been possible had I not used a computer, right? So the computer is a kind of metaphor machine. It's a provocation um, to doing things. Um, so the question is, if you can get anything and make a, a, a painting by numbers picture of it, what are you going to do as an artist? What's going to be adequate as art? What's going to be acceptable in a gallery or, or, or not or whatever online or anything as a piece of contemporary art? Is it justifiable? Of course, most of the stuff that you do, that I do, is bullshit, but most of what everybody does is 99% bullshit anyway. So it'll get better. It'll go down to 98 perhaps. Um, this is a frame painted by numbers. Well, not painted actually. This is the point. The numbers and the lines that show you what areas you're in get more and more important, the actual thing drops away. This is a piece of music, um, it's Frank Zappa actually, but uh, with a painting by numbers thing. Um, this might even have come from somebody who was here on Facebook, um, but I, I saw this cover and I really wanted to do painting by numbers stuff with this. I've been trying to get this book. Um, you can get it on Amazon, it costs very nearly a thousand dollars. I, I believe in, in deeply inverse uh, proportion to its literary value, but still. So the numbers pile in and become much more important than the subject matter. This is a section, looks like a nice piece of meat, doesn't it? Well, it probably is, but it's certainly a slice through a human body um, turned inside out. Um, this is the legs, the thighs. It looks, the Germans have a word for tasty, it's lecker. Isn't it lecker? 
you could lick your lips, it's lacquer. And there's the feet, and there's a sort of painting by numbers thing. I, took, I, I started doing some work. I, I kind of don't like Damien Hirst very much, um, not, slightly not personally when he was in Berlin, but, but also the poor lamb trapped in its cage. So I started trying to free it and do various things. Um, I put it on a cushion so that it would be more comfortable. Um, and then did a painting of the cushion and things. So it sort of goes around in circles. But again, I wouldn't have been, I wouldn't have thought of doing this without the computer. Okay, attention mapping. Um, you, this is a picture of a courtyard in the place I used to teach in France with snow in and a different attention map. So where people look at it does that. And what I then did was to expand the bits that people looked at. What I really want to do is to do the opposite of this, to invert it, turn it inside out and have a huge projection on a gallery wall and where you're looking at gets smaller. So everything you're attending to is fugitive. It will disappear. And I think this will be quite nice. Um, inside out on a protein beam accelerator. Um, I went to uh, the University Hospital at Essen and um, was talking to them about the idea or the possibility of me being inside the proton beam thing, which they use for targeting cancers very, very precisely, and take an artwork in there, which would actually um, have the proton beam fo focused on one little bit of it. Um, and you, the tables that you lie on here, I mean, they're actually made for drawing. It's, it's wonderful. They wheel you into the thing on, on those. Um, I asked them what happened if something went wrong. And they said, well, don't worry about it. Um, we've got a handle. It's, they wheel you. If everything fails, they shove this handle in and turn it around like starting an old Austin 7 or something like that. Um, this is where the equipment becomes the central thing and what they're drawing there doesn't matter too much. Um, four people trying to draw four different things and they're connected by metal rods. Um, so that if I try to draw this and you try to draw that, what happens is um, a mixture of the two. So it's a question of cooperation or of competition. These people are, are being zombified, but they're also being protected with protective clothing and they're going to have a fight and they use canvases as a shield. The point here was, like with the sensor, it was the, the, the reactions of the audience, um, but also what was left on the floor, on the equipment, on the protective clothing and so on. Nothing to do with the computer, but it's part of this um, thread. And um, I, I sort of came across these in, in Germany, sort of advertising screens on urinals. Um, and I just wanted to show you that for no good reason. Um, there we go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I'd say a, a couple of quick things is that um, Brian actually donated some work to the collection as well. And um, this is an interesting piece because it's two pieces. One was an original plotter drawing from 1980, 80-ish? Yeah, something like that, yeah. And then it was a contemporary revisiting of that work with your painting, paint by numbers um, approach. So it makes for quite an interesting um, combination. You've got an early piece, plot of drawing, and then a, a modern piece, one of your painting by numbers. So that's very good. Um, I think the idea of painting by numbers is, is really quite important. It's, it sort of exchanges responsibilities and you never know where the thing lies really. Is it you or? Yeah. Something? And actually just a bit of a big coincidence is um, yesterday I got an email from eBay and it said I might be interested in this book. And it was one of your 1980s Learn Compu Computer Programming books. Ah. And um, they wanted two ninety nine for it. So I thought, well, I have to buy it. So I'm going to relearn computer programming using uh, your book. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I wrote these books for kids for Usborne. Um, and they said, here's a thousand quid, take it or leave it. If you sell a lot, you'll be really angry. And it was translated into 28 different languages and sold over a million and a half worldwide. And I only got a thousand quid, so I was really angry. And but it was a nice book, I'm proud of it. And the odd thing was that in the sort of email that came from eBay, next to the British one, 299, there was one in Hungarian. 
yeah, I've got one in Finnish as well. It was translated into bloody Welsh, and it's amazing. Amazing, yeah. So uh, anybody who's not a programmer, or anybody like me who's a long-time programmer, but fancy he's relearning to try and get hold of that. <laughs> <laughs> a bit okay, old. Okay, um, we've done really well on the timing, actually. We're just a little bit behind, but that's not a problem. But we are now, we have our final speaker, who is um, Jonathan Armour. Um, so do you want to do a, a little intro and then take your full 10 minutes, we don't have to rush you. Um, look forward to hearing what you have to say. Okay, thank you Sean. Um, I probably only need about six or seven minutes to be honest. I can see why I'm following um, Brian actually, which will become apparent in a moment. Um, I am an artist, I work across media, what they now call post-disciplinary. Um, I'll give a quick overview of my practice and illustrate it with excerpts from three different works. My first degree was actually in engineering, BSc in engineering, which led to an early career in IT, in real-time systems design and development. Uh, and then I moved to become an early Microsoft Windows developer on version 1.03 of the SDK or the um, IT historians in the group. Um, however, in 2012 to 13, I did a foundation and moved straight into a Masters of Fine Art from 2013 to 15. And since then, really, I've been fascinated with the body and the skin, which I see as an interface between the person and the world around. Um, I've developed techniques to explore the human terrain, the human geography, sometimes opening the surface like a map projection. Um, the use of computing is kind of central to my practice, even where the outcome may not suggest it. And you'll probably see that in the way through. I tend to work collaboratively with real people. Um, I'm interested in working with other people in the group as well. Uh, where I'm often exploring aspects of who they are and something about them. This work, this particular work is about a guy, Martin, with cerebral palsy. It's about exploring both his disability and his devout religious beliefs. Thus the, uh, the kind of cruciform um, composition and the suggestion of stigmata. Um, he, here we've opened the scars from where he had two periods of surgery to correct some of the, the defects caused by cerebral palsy when the skeleton is developing. He did adjustment to, adjustments to his knees, his feet were reconstructed, and at one point he had his femur realigned. Um, I often work with people through different projects, and Martin is somebody I work with in about seven different projects. He was driven by a desire to look more beautiful and he was fascinated by tattoos. Um, he was educated at Hereford Cathedral School, so he saw the Hereford map, which is the medieval map of the world, Mapa Mundi, on display every morning. Um, and that somehow connected him with a pre-Reformation Christianity. So we created a new skin for him by tattooing the Mapa Mundi um, onto his skin. And here we can see the detail, the people, the animals, the rivers, the towns, and so on. And of course, then using 21st century technology, we can wrap his new skin back around him and we can imagine him exploring kind of new territories, new worlds, new planets, protected only by his kind of divine cloak. And then you can also do things like take off the tattoo on its own and display it separately. Part of my practice is interrogating um, the binary states of inside and outside. I like to kind of try and envisage the inside from the outside and vice versa. Just tell me how well is this running? Can you see it okay? Looks all right to me, yeah. yeah. So this work, Infinite Surface, is from a collaboration with Professor Richard Solden-Smith, who's um, Dean of Norwich University of the Arts. 
it's challenging the stigma associated with living with HIV. Um, Richard has been positive since 1994, and his own creative photography is about that issue. And we're actually inviting the viewer to search inside his body to find this virus, which supposedly is lurking to uh, infect again. So just let this run for a moment. And following uh, this, we've managed to get funding from Gilead, which is a big pharmaceutical company, or a VR version of this, where the visitor can, visitor can literally walk around inside the body. And if those, any of you are familiar with the issue of room scale, you realize that's a big challenge because this became a very big model. So we actually had to use a VR treadmill to allow the visitor to do the walking, while the walking obviously in one spot. More recently, um, following a number of conversations about mental health with some of my colleagues, I began to wonder about the human mind, um, where it might be located, and kind of trying to visualize that, that place, that space. And drawing from a number of people whom I've digitized, including myself actually, um, this specimen series, this is one of them, explores how our physical heads kind of merge, mutate, and interfere, and in doing so, create a space for imaginations to, to have multiple readings. And I guess that's akin to the, the abstractions of the ink block diagrams, you know, the Rorschach diagrams, where they're differently interpreted differently by each viewer depending on their own psychological, emotional experiences. So I'm just going to let that run. Um, thank you guys for staying this long and listening. Um, Sean, happy to take questions and answers. If I can stop that or I can let it run if you prefer. Um, well, so um, well done everyone actually. We're, we're five minutes over and we did start at four minutes past so I think we're pretty much dead on time. So uh, thanks very much. Um, if you have any um, particular questions for Jonathan, I think we could um, take those now. Okay, I can't see any hands going up. A, a, a quick one I wanted to ask is that um, the mapping um, looked really detailed, the sort of image, the, um, the, the skin. And yeah. how is that produced? Do you use some sort of 3D scanner or do you manually sort of edit the, um, the scan? Um, they've done, they've created using photogrammetry. Oh, yeah. Um, where you are instantly capturing the entire surface of the body using about 230 cameras and then stitching each image together. Mm. Um, then in addition to that, these ones are very high resolution because I wanted to create prints from them in life size. So creating, um, you know, a life size print of the skin is about two square meters. Um, and take at uh, 300 dpi you're working with very large files yeah. So yeah it was quite a challenge to get people to work to that level of detail and specification and, and the virtual reality side of things is some, something you've tried or you're hoping to try you said no, no, that, that was that done that was, sorry um the film i showed you was the kind of the first stage then we created it turned it into um, a vr model uh, and then we actually exhibited the VR system in a couple of exhibitions, two years ago in fact. Um, what was the response of the audience? Because it looks a bit gruesome and I wonder if people feel a bit um, uneasy. Uh, most people went in with a real sense of wonderment, you know, they kind of... Um, was it the film The Incredible Voyage of the micro submarine going inside the body? Um, that's what people kept referring to when they did it, but literally 
they had a headset on and they were in there and they could walk along the body into an arm, up into the head, look around. Um, one guy I was looking after it one day, um, we moved the exhibition to uh, Dartington Hall in, in Devon. One guy came in, put the headset on and just looked and then suddenly took it off quickly. And I had to set him down because he's feeling quite faint. He just, it was too anatomical for him. Mm. So, yeah. I very much like to see it. Do you get the chance to exhibit it often? And the problem with more complex work is it can be hard to exhibit. Um, we, I have the computer. It's a high spec games machine, as you would imagine, um, with the VR system in my studio. I no longer have the VR treadmill, mm. but it can be run using the, the usual um, hand devices where you kind of throw and, and go forward that way. It's not quite as effective because the whole point about walking is that you are physically moving around inside the space mm. and therefore you as a body inhabit another body is a much more um, direct and powerful um, experience than using devices to transfer you over to another part of it. Mm. Okay. So yeah. Well it'd be nice um, to continue talking really and find out if there's a chance we could show it at a either conference in London or um, a CAS event somewhere. It'd be very interesting to see. Um, well, the people who have the VR treadmill I'm still in contact with, um, they could be persuaded perhaps to let us have it again. So, um, the, Some of the newer headsets like the Oculus Quest actually does allow for room scale um, VR without having to have lots of sensors around. It has this inside out tracking, as we're talking about yeah. inside out. Um, so the tracking equipment is on the headset, so you can walk around a room. It might be something yeah. that could be adapted for that. Well, that, that was, the, we had the room scale before, but the problem is it's the size of the scale you need. Mm. You'd end up having, having to have a physical room much bigger than you'd ever get in an yeah, exhibition. Yeah, I understand. That's the yeah. problem, really. Yeah, that's great. Um, well, thanks to everyone who spoke tonight and everyone you know, 90 odd percent of our audience is still here after an hour and a half. So that's really good. We only had a couple of people who had to leave early. And I think that's been a really interesting set of talks. Um, for me, it's combined some people I know, I know quite well, with some of you who I really, you know, we haven't met before. We only met through um, this channel, including yourself, Jonathan. So I think it, for me personally, it's been a really productive session. Hopefully um, speakers found it interesting um, and the audience as well. Um, so, like I say, I'm going to, um, this has been recorded, it's been going on YouTube as well. I'm going to capture this and as per normal, I'll pop it up on the um, YouTube channel. Um, and this sort of marks the end of what I'm calling the first season of talks, which started with just one talk really. Oh, there's a lockdown on, wouldn't it be fun to have a talk? And now we've, I think we've got something that there's clearly a, an audience for. So um, if you go to the Computer Arts Society website, which I will... I've got, uh, I've got a cat climbing over me here and, and then now sitting on the keyboard. <laughs> All right, I'll just get my, uh, get the website back. Well, what you'll see on the Computer Arts Society website is actually we put together the whole of the next, what you might call season. And um, oh, I'm going to have to just type it in. Um, computer. Right, we'll get there. Computerartssociety.com. Um, on there, we've put together a, a season of talks, and I think we've got a, an equally interesting set. So um, next week, we're going to go straight into the next one. Um, we have Andy Lomez, who's prepared a, a new presentation on his current work, um, Deep Learning as a Creative Collaborator, or How I Learned to, lo to Stop Worrying and Love AI. Andy Lomez. Um, we then have a talk by Genetic Moo, who are good friends of the Computer Arts Society and um, have a, pro, uh, a piece that's called Micro World that they've adapted to work from home, Micro World at Home. And they've started to do some sort of rem experiments in remote interaction and collaboration. And um, they're gonna give a talk the week after next. And then the Saturday after, we're gonna have a live Micro World um, we're having it at eight o'clock in the evening, so hopefully our friends from the States can join us as well, uh, as well. And this will be a sort of interactive event 
taking place in Genetic News front room, but hopefully allowing you to interact remotely from wherever you are. Um, after that, we have Boredom Research, um, who have some fascinating work, which um, I encourage you to have a little look at beforehand. Um, like I say, it's on the CAS um, website. Um, and then I'm going to give a talk about the um, archive project, the Computer Arts Society's CAS 50 archive. So we have those four talks already scheduled and lined up. And then I think I wanted to see how well this will go, but I think it's gone very well. So I think we'll do another short talk session as well. So anybody out there who fancies doing another one of these or one of these talks, um, let me know. Let us know. Uh, let me show and see at cutterfish.com. And we'll schedule another nine or so, I think. So we'll have some more talks um, then as well. Um, and that will be sort of season two. And if people are still interested in having this event, then we'll schedule a season three and so on. And I'm very much um, confident that we're going to continue this even after the lockdown, maybe not every week, but on a regular basis. Um, so it makes for quite a nice season. Four talks, uh, short talks evening and a live event um, with Genetic Moo. And then, of course, on the 28th, then there's the Flux social as well. So uh, I've popped that on the web page, but we'll share the information. That could be another opportunity for people here to sort of meet up online. Do you use Zoom as well? Um, after do you use no um, what tool what technology do you use, use? Um, for the flux social we use Jitsi oh, yeah. um, which is like an open source um, yeah, nice and easy for you. Yeah. yeah okay so that, that's quite a few things coming up and I think what we'll start doing is share uh, anything else that appears amongst the group as well so um, I think in total we had about 250 people register across the series so of course some people come to one event don't come to all of them um, so I'm going to mail out the group, which includes you, to let you know what we have planned. So hopefully we'll maintain our audience and, uh, and we'll keep these events running. Um, I thought your final thing to say is that I'm setting this up as a meeting series. So it won't be using this slightly more formal tool. It'll go back to a big screen of everyone who's here, which um, seems to be something people like. I'll default it so your camera's off. So if you don't want to be seen, just don't switch on your camera. It <coughs> should be fine. Um, and you'll um, subscribe to the one meeting invitation and that will then allow you to come in for all well, five, including the short talks. Um, but what I might do is send out the odd reminder by email during the um, run so that um, people remember that they're happening. Okay, so I, I think that's everything for now. Um, again, I'm going to kind of quickly look at the hands up. If anybody wants to say anything, um, Yep. Uh, could, what what can we do to help grow these numbers? Because there's clearly brilliant brains around for all of the last few weeks. What can we do to help? Grow well, numbers? I think it's something we need to continue doing because I think we have got a sort of a, an audience, or I'd call it our audience. Um, we we can be a victim of our own success because then we have a hundred places in our Zoom package, which is why I've been very keen on testing out. Um, uh, YouTube and so on to make sure that if we did get over a hundred mm -hmm. um, they could watch even though they can't ask questions watch via YouTube um, and that seems to have worked fine so I think invite colleagues and people who might be interested encourage them to look at the previous talks mm -hmm. um, and yeah let, let's see where it grows see how it grows and where it goes to okay thank you okay well thank you all very much um, I shall, yeah, wave goodbye and we'll be able to see every time. Next week we'll see everyone. So, uh, sure. thank you, John. Bye. Thanks, then. Okay, bye. Thank you. Bye. bye.